Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, I hope you're well. Uh, in talking about knees, I think it's been well established now that uh, now and finally that navigation in total arthroplasty uh, has uh, tremendous value. Uh, one study that supports this was from the Australian Registry in 2015, looking at their data from 2002 through 2012. And that data showed that uh, computer navigation, when used in patients under the age of 65, made an important difference in the survivorship of the implants. Even beginning at year one after implantation, implants failed at almost uh, twice the rate or more than two-thirds higher rate than the uh, than the navigated knees. The non-navigated knees failed uh, right away uh, at a higher rate. That was not, in the initial study, that was not able to be demonstrated for patients over the age of 65. But looking three years later at the data, we can see that even in patients over the age of 65, which are the uh, uh, lower two uh, lines, the red and the blue, they start to diverge at 10 years. So even in older patients, presumably less active, less uh, beating up of their joints, those patients have a benefit from navigation, uh, perhaps related to balance and implant position. Balance, as I mentioned, also impacts outcome. Uh, this has been shown uh, initially by the, or by many people, but including the orthosensor group, uh, which in one of their uh, many studies has shown uh, better knee function scores when knees are balanced using their criteria. They're using a pressure sensor measuring pressure at a variety of different poses of uh, degrees of flexion. And they're using criteria generally of a 15 pound side to side balance between the compartments and less than 10 millimeters of AP translation. So when patients met those criteria, which was 87% of the time in this particular study, those patients definitely had better uh, knee society pain scores, function scores, and Womack scores. There are a variety of uh, static sensors available in the market, uh, orthosensor being one of the most popular. But the problem with this is you're doing soft tissue releases to balance these knees after your bony cuts. There's no predictive aspect to this, uh, generally speaking. So you can achieve intraoperative balance, but you have to perform it after the fact. When you're looking at pressure measurements, which is the graph on the left, a surgeon, the same surgeon taking the knee through a range of motion several times, three, three runs in this example, you can see that the pressure measurements vary considerably, just the same surgeon holding the same leg, just going back and forth. So there is quite a bit of variability when you uh, are trying to measure pressure. When you're measuring gaps under a fixed pressure, which is what the uh, balance bot does, you can see that the same surgeon doing the same run of measurements gets the same gaps, essentially, through the range of motion each and every time. And that's the consistency that's highlighted by the balance bot system. When you also look at measuring gaps preoperatively, prospectively, predictively, and then compare that to what you get, you see a tremendous overlap and less than a millimeter of difference between what you predicted and what you got in the end, both on the medial and lateral sides. And that's indicated here where you have the red and the blue are the predicted gaps in the blue, the measured gaps are the red. And really, what you really get is one big purple graph because both of those ranges overlap with very tight uh, concordance. When you're measuring with the balance bot, you can measure through the whole range of motion, which is different than uh, all other systems, really. What you also find is that when you measure from 10 degrees of flexion, which is once you've gotten past the screw home mechanism of zero to 10 degrees, if you measure from 10 degrees flexion through 90 degrees of flexion in a knee balanced with a balance bot, you find there's less than a millimeter of difference in 90% of those cases. So it's a very stable knee throughout the whole range of motion. That compares very favorably to uh, look, looking at the literature where knees balance from flexion to extension can vary quite a bit and have less than a millimeter of difference in only one third to one half of the cases. So a balance block gives you a much more stable knee through the whole range of motion. The basic technique uh, is a attachment of pretty typical trackers. Then there is a uh, uh, a proprietary bone morphing technology that creates a very accurate model of the knee. Uh, you then attach your tibial tracker, which or your tibial uh, cutting guide, which is in the middle. Do your tibial cut, which we'll go into in just a minute, and then put the balance spot in the knee, which is depicted on the right.
So this is a tibia first technique primarily, or most effectively. Here's the screen you're looking at when you're getting prepared to make your tibial cut. The green line indicates where you'll be cutting. You have choices. So at the bottom here highlighted in yellow, you can select the depth of your cuts on the medial and lateral side. You can select how much varus or valgus you want to put into the tibia preoperatively, and that uh, may be a factor, especially if you have a bad deformity or if you prefer a more kinematic uh, method of thinking, you can incorporate that into your tibial planning. You can adjust the slope uh, here as depicted on the top right. To achieve that then, you will look at the blue uh, numbers, will tell you exactly where you are in terms of adjusting your tibial cutting guide. You adjust the tibial cutting guide by turning the screws, which are color coded and on the screen pop up and will direct you to will direct you to uh, turn the screws to achieve your desired plan. So you put in the plan, you attach the uh, tracker, and then adjust the screws, and then your tibia plan will be executed the way you plan. Once the uh, tibia is cut, you insert the balance box. Oh, there's some feedback there somewhere. If someone can turn off their or turn on their mute. You insert the balance spot, and that will apply a set force that you can set uh, through the range of motion, and it can vary from flexion through extension. This is important. This is just the acquisition of the ligament balance of the knee. So the balance spot's in place. A single pass of extending the knee gradually, supporting the knee with one hand, extending the knee at the ankle with the other, this is how you obtain your ligament balance of the knee. The balance plot is implying the known forces that you've selected, and it then plots out for you the medial and lateral gaps through the whole range of motion. And really no other device will give you that degree of information. What you come up with then is your ability to make your plan. So you then plan the femur. What you can do on the screen here, and I'll just go through a series of examples, is you can rotate, flex and extend, uh, varus valgus, uh, or take more or less bone off the femur to achieve what you want for a final balance plan of the knee. So in this case, we're on the, the varus valgus screen highlighted in white at the top left. So if we add a degree of valgus, you can see that things, if the second degree of valgus, things begin to open up on the lateral side, tighten on the medial side, a little tighter on the medial side with more valgus. You can do the same thing with varus. It's now going to get tighter on the lateral side as we go into more varus. You can work on flexion and extension, I'm sorry, on rotation. So here right now we're four degrees externally rotated with respect to the posterior condyles. We can change that to be more external rotation, which will now close your gap, uh, your flexion gap laterally more. You get a little tighter now, six degrees, seven degrees. It turns yellow, but just as a warning track to tell you that you're uh, beyond a uh, preset limit, but you're not restricted from going there. And there are times you may go there. It gets a little tighter now. We're at 10 millimeters in the flexion space laterally. You can go the other way. You can internally rotate. So we're now at three, two, one. You can see it gets tighter on the medial side. And all that time, you can look at the far right graph, which is basically showing, I'll just go back a little bit. It just shows you how it, you can, right now, we're really just adjusting our uh, flexion space on the medial and lateral sides by rotating the femoral condyle. And this will show you what your final desire is, which is really to have a green line as straight as possible on the medial lateral sides. So in this case, the farthest to the right green line is the lateral compartment, and the one just to the left of it is the medial compartment. And you can make all your adjustments that way. In this case, we'll go now to uh, flexing the component. We can flex the component if we want to uh, shut down the flexion space symmetrically. So here's a one degree of flexion, two degrees of flexion, three degrees of flexion. You can see that the flexion space is getting tighter and tighter on the graph on the right. One more degree of flexion there. Now we can take more distal femur, which is not something you, you would want to do often, but there are times where you uh, may and can. In this case, we have nine and nine and a half as our resections of the distal femur. We can take a little more. Here's another half millimeter, another half millimeter, another half millimeter. You can see that the flex to the extension space is getting bigger. What you can also see, just as a side light, and we'll talk about this more later, is you can see that on the graph, we're now getting a little more of a bowing. We've lost the straight character of those lines, 
and that is something to pay attention to, and that is something that happens when you take more distal femur, and there are ways to work around that. And this is something that you don't see, you, you can't see, you just can't visualize this with other systems. You can visualize it with the balance spot and address it, and what it does is keeps you out of the trouble of mid-flexion laxity. We've taken a fair amount of distal femur here, take up just a little more. You can see a little more bowing there, and that's about as far as we'll go with that. But these are the adjustments you can make on the screen before any releases. The only thing you've done here is your basic approach, and you've taken off the, your tibial cut that you planned. So now you've planned your whole femur, you can go ahead and make your cuts. We'll go through a couple examples in a minute. You attach the uh, cutting block, the eye block, which is the rotating a guide driven by the computer based on the plan that you developed on the previous pages. So go ahead and make your cuts under your control. And I might add it's a lot, lot quieter than the Mako and a lot, lot faster than the Mako. And then you go ahead and put the balance spot back in once you've done your femoral cuts to confirm that you have matched the plan that you made. This is just, again, reacquiring the femoral trials in. It's the exact same movement, gently extending the knee once. will get you a good readout of your ligament balance now with the femoral trial in place. It just confirms that you've matched your plan. Here's just an, and here's an example we'll go through just to show. This is the initial kinematics. So the graph on the left with the green bars shows you the degree of laxity at each 10 degree increment through the whole range of motion. So you manually test the knee to the extent you, that you can. The uh, point to be made here though is once you get past 30 or 40 degrees of flexion, it is a little difficult to really test the various valgus laxity of the knee because it's hard to grip the thigh in a bigger patient. The hip rotates to an unpredictable and inconsistent degree, but this is what you get with standard manual testing. Then the graph on the right, the pictures on the right, show you while holding the knee in full extension, the maximum amount of extension with a gravity hang from holding the heel, this knee has a four degree varus deformity in full extension and extends one degree beyond neutral, so one degree of hyperextension. So not a terribly deformed knee, it's a good way to start. So we'll plan our tibial cut. This is actually the very same uh, picture from before that I had used. We're planning a four millimeters off the low side, not a terribly deformed knee, eight millimeters off the high side. This is our plan. That's what we achieved. We go ahead and put the balance spot in and get our initial ligament balance, which comes up like this and takes you then directly to the femoral planning page. What's important here is to note this is where you would kind of be if you had a, if you were working on, a, if you were working on a measured resection model. This knee has greater space in extension than it does in flexion which is not something you would necessarily detect otherwise until you put your trials in and then would have to start performing releases. So this particular knee has 11 millimeters of a gap in extension laterally, 10 millimeters of gap in extension medially, and then about five and a half or six millimeters of gap in full flexion. So it's a tight knee in flexion. This is easily fixed without having to do any releases. So what we do is, and I'll go back and forth between these screens a couple of times, is by making a few adjustments here, you now see we have green, straight green lines, which is really our goal. We have an even 10 millimeter gap through the whole range of motion on this predictive algorithm. Again, this is all before making any femoral cuts and before any potential releases. And what we've done is, you can see we've put the femoral component in one degree of varus, we have a size two, and we, uh, applied one degree of external rotation, I'm sorry, one degree of extension of the femur at the bottom. We kept our rotation the same. I'm gonna go back to the planning page, the first screen of the planning page. So we had initially no varus valgus, we had a size two plus femur on the bottom left, and we had no flexion extension built into the system. So just by changing these three parameters on the screen virtually, we're now able to take a knee that was very tight in extension, or very tight inflection, excuse me, and make it balanced through the whole range of motion. At least that's what we're predicting here. So with that plan, we then attach the balance spot, make our cuts. You validate the cuts so the computer can see exactly what you cut. We cut very close to our plan uh, within half a millimeter and one degree of our plan. So we're very happy with that. 
And then we'll go ahead and put the thermal trial on, put the balance plot back in, and you can see we got very close to our plan with this. We have straight green lines. It does get a little tight uh, on the medial side in full extension between 10 and zero degrees, which we expect. That's normal with the screw home mechanism. But this is a well-balanced knee uh, according to the balance plot uh, predictive algorithm. You can also measure the pressures. So if you are familiar with the ortho sensor or the pressure sensor technologies, this screen uh, essentially mimics what that provides you, except that it provides you that uh, pressure uh, measurement through the whole range of motion. So what you see is at 10 degree increments, a balance uh, depicted by the green dot with the white circle of the balance between the two compartments, medial to lateral, through the whole range of motion. Now, as I pointed out earlier, this is the least reliable way to measure balance in a knee because you can go run to run, just the same surgeon, same patient, not letting go of the leg and re-gripping it, and have a fair amount of variability run to run because pressure measurements are very sensitive to very subtle position changes in the limb. Whereas when you're using the balance spot by applying a known pressure, it's very fast uh, and pro the processor is very fast and the motors are very fast. So any changes in position that you apply are compensated for instantaneously. And that's why uh, using it in the intended mode is really the most accurate way, much more so than pressure. We can compare the kinematics. This is your, this is your manual measurement uh, that uh, was taken on the left at the beginning and then your manual measurement that you take at the end. So that even uh, by manual measurement criteria, you can see this knee is straighter and uh, tighter and has a great range of motion. Uh, maximum uh, extension is minus six degrees or six degrees of hyperextension with a maximum flexion of 140. So this is a got great range of motion. It's a well-balanced knee and uh, she'll do very well. We are looking at this prospectively. We have uh, uh, so far, more than 5,000 of these balance plot procedures since uh, October of 2017, when it was approved by the FDA. Uh, more than 2,500 of those are captured and entered in the core and joint arthroplasty registry, and more than 600 patients are enrolled in a prospective uh, patient-reported outcomes uh, study at six sites that are listed in the bottom right. What we're uh, aiming for is to characterize the accuracy of gap prediction versus the execution, and I showed you some preliminary data before. Uh, we're looking to compare the balance achieved with predictive balancing uh, versus standard resections, and we're measuring these particular outcomes. Uh, the patients are filling these out at uh, three months, uh, six months, and uh, one year and two years. And we also want to look at other uh, associations between patient factors and intraoperative factors uh, that can affect balance, alignment, soft tissue releases, and outcomes. So when we look at the, uh, uh, these patients, we have uh, almost uh, or over five, or almost 550 balance spot patients uh, looking at three months, six months, and one year. And you can see that these patients all start out at the same point for their uh, WOMAX scores. They all, for pain, function, stiffness, and total score, these patients are all our similar population. But at three months, six months, and one year, the balance by patients are outperforming uh, those patients in the uh, OR Tech database, which is a contemporary database of uh, total knee patients so capturing these same data points, that the balance by patients are substantially above uh, to a significant, statistically significant degree at least, uh, at all uh, points in time. Uh, we find a similar result when we compare the balance by patients to the American Joint Replacement Registry patients. Uh, at uh, uh, the similar at one year time point. So pain, stiffness, and function uh, all perform, are all reported as uh, better outcomes for the balance plot compared to the general total knee population. When we look at patient satisfaction uh, with the balance plot system, at three months, uh, patient satisfaction is 91%, 92% at six months, and over 96% at one year. And that's very favorable uh, compared to the literature. And the literature we looked at is not the literature from uh, strictly 1970 and 1980. The uh, citations are on the bottom. Uh, these include studies from the 2000 teens uh, right up through 2018. And those patient satisfaction scores still run in the mid 70% to 
80%. So the balance bot is definitely performing much better for patient reported outcomes uh, than contemporary total knee literature. That takes into account, I think, all the modern pain medicine protocols and all the other adjunctive things we do. We're really comparing uh, a total knee versus a balance bot knee. Also, the Australian Registry has started gathering patient satisfaction data. Overall, again, this is not balance bot data. This is the general Australian Registry population reports only an 82% patient satisfaction, uh, again, comparing to the 96 uh, plus percent uh, with the balance bot. And then this is a very contemporary uh, group, uh, similar types of patients, uh, similar demographic. Uh, but much better results with the balance bot. This is very recent data. Another aspect of this that we're looking at is looking at femur first versus tibia first. I mentioned that the balance bot system is best used as a tibia first system, and I had done femur first for many, many years and changed to tibia first to take advantage of the predictive capabilities of the balance bot. And this really highlights the difference. When you do femur first, you're in the position of having to do releases after the fact. At least you have data from the balance bot to show you where you can perform your releases most effectively, but you're still much better off with the tibia first technique. You can see that in the graph on the left. When you're looking at medial to lateral balance, the tibia first group is depicted in pink and the femur first in blue. You can see that the medial to lateral gap difference at all degrees of flexion, depicted here as 10, 40, and 90 degrees, are uh, exhibit a smaller difference, medial to lateral gap, and also a tighter, banded difference, medial to lateral, in the tibia first group. So those are tighter, uh, more consistent knees with the tibia first group. When you look at activity score, the UCLA activity score on the right, tibia first patients versus femur first patients perform almost one full point higher on the UCLA activity score uh, to a significant degree. And that's the difference between moderate activity sometimes and moderate activity regularly. So that's a big difference from a uh, quality of life standpoint. Definitely demonstrable with tibia first. Here's a case study with a more complicated deformity. This patient has a flexion contracture and a moderate varus deformity. You can see that here on the right, eight degrees of varus and 11 degrees of flexion contracture. The knee runs far off to the varus side uh, on the kinematic testing preoperatively, and this is our starting point. So we'll look at our tibia cuts in this case. In this case, uh, uh, taking a 10 off the high side, two degree posterior slope because it's a tight knee and extension. Uh, I don't want to lose, uh, I don't have a much bigger flexion gap than I already will have. So two degrees posterior slope, uh, no varus valgus baked into the tibia, make that cut. Go ahead, put the balance spot in, we get initial ligament balance, which then takes us next to our femur planning page. Again, this is where you would stand with a uh, measured resection technique. We have our distal resection where we're, uh, or we have our distal or extension where we're very tight, eight millimeters on the medial side, 10 on the lateral side compared to a 14 in flexion on the medial side and 11 uh, on the lateral side. This is a complicated deformity. One danger point to highlight is if you look at the graph on the right, the bow in mid flexion in blue on the valgus side shows you that this patient is at risk for mid flexion laxity. So if you simply balance this knee to the extension point, which is at this point 10 degrees, or full extension at zero, and it looked at 90, you could make this knee balance, but you would have mid-flexion laxity where at 30, 40, 50 degrees, you're looking at three, four, five millimeters of wobble in the knee that you may or may not be able to detect in your ligament testing manually. So with some changes here, we're gonna go from this to this. What we did was uh, added three degrees of varus, to the femur, rotated from three degrees of external rotation down to zero degrees of rotation, and went up to a 12 millimeter insert, and also changed the balance point, which is highlighted at the top right, to 15 degrees. 
this system allows you to pick what you what degree you wish to call uh, full extension for the purposes of ligament balance. When you have a knee with a significant flexion contracture, it makes sense to move that balance point down to say 15 degrees, which has the effect of increasing the space in full extension and letting you balance to that point. The consequence of that, and everything is a trade-off when you're making uh, decisions on the femur, is you get a little tighter in extension, but that's the primary pathology. You expect this patient to be tighter uh, in full extension, and you can address that if you have to with a posterior release at the end, which you, in some complicated patients, you may have to do some releases. In many, many patients, you don't, but in the most complex, you may. This will guide you. So in this case, by balancing at 15 degrees as the full extension point, which is precise and reproducible, much more than you could in your own mind's eye, or that I could, at least, you can then bring that flexion and extension space into better balance. Our predicted gaps here show just a little bit of uh, mid-flexion laxity. This is well within the acceptable degree and well within what matches good clinical outcomes. And what we have done is not taking too much distal femur. If we, I'm gonna go back and forth between the screens again. If you look at the bottom left in our extension view, we're taking 10 millimeters of distal femur uh, on the medial side and nine millimeters laterally. Uh, we're not taking, we're not into the notch. We go back, we had here seven and a half and nine. So we're really only taking a little more off the medial side, uh, which we uh, did by doing some varus on the uh, femur. So we've not, started slicing into our distal femur, which would have the effect of uh, worsening the mid-flexion laxity rather than improving it. So now we go ahead and made our cuts, put our trial in, and measure with the balance spot again. And this gives us an even better outcome than we had predicted. Uh, still a little bit of, it's not perfect, it's not green the whole way, but the mid-flexion laxity is uh, a millimeter and a half, and this is a really well-balanced knee. This knee will perform well, as uh, uh, you'll hear in subsequent uh, talks, that uh, this knee is consistent with very good results. We look at the pressure data, uh, which is the next screen. This is also well balanced side to side by pressure criteria. And also kinematically, when we look at this and compare our pre-op to our post-op, this is also very satisfactory. What we have is two degrees of extension hyperextension versus the 11 degrees or eight or 11 that we had preoperatively, I'm sorry, 11 degrees uh, we had before, and we've uh, straightened out the various deformity. So the takeaways here are that the uh, balance spot and omnibotics allow uh, predictive gap balancing through the whole range of motion. And I think that's a very important point. Now, all the other systems rely on either uh, putting in a uh, pressure sensing device and taking certain poses or they rely on your manual manipulation of the limb, which varies person to person, but also varies patient to patient, and it varies between where you are in the range of motion and it, how big the patient's thigh is. You just can't really get the same accurate measurement all the time. And we do have excellent outcomes uh, that we've uh, documented uh, when you use a, a uh, targeting a balance and using the tibia first approach generally. So balance can be measured and achieved, which I think we've shown uh, where to go for the ideal target and what to do with particular deformities uh, is the subject of uh, some of the further talks that will uh, come in the next few days. Uh, and they will be uh, well presented uh, uh, by uh, Jeff, uh, Jeff and Amber. Uh, it's great and very exciting data. As we uh, peel back the layers here, it just gets better and better. There are things that we were never able to see that we can now see. And I would say no other system shows it at all. And by going through iterations of uh, learning with the system, we've come to the point where we have great evidence on what constitutes a balanced knee that satisfies a patient and what to do in certain situations where there are trade-offs. And in knees with complex deformities or even more than a mild deformity, there are trade-offs. At least you can see what they are. You can make your decisions. You can make the vast majority of your decisions proactively before cuts or releases. And I think in the end, the patients are much happier. Thanks.
for their questions, Chris. Chris, I think you're muted. You guys hear me now? Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Uh, we do have some questions. I'll just remind everybody if you have any additional questions, please feel free to enter them through the uh, the questions bar on the uh, GoToWebinar app. Um, one here is related to uh, the learning curve and the transition to, to tibia first. So, Dr. Keggy, you mentioned that you were a femur first surgeon for many years before switching over. Uh, could you kind of describe your transition process? Uh, yeah. Switching over to first the system and then to tibia first for the group? Yeah, so I was using uh, measure resection femur first for many, many years, and I was very happy with that. I thought patients uh, were doing very well, and they were doing well. But the patients now are doing far, far better. Uh, I'm very pleased with the transition. When uh, this system was uh, being envisioned uh, and talked about, uh, I could see the potential for the benefit of going tibia first. So I went to tibia first uh, before the balance bot to uh, get my uh, experience going tibia first and then uh, changed to and then added the balance bot when it became available. The change to tibia first was not difficult whatsoever. I mean, that was just a matter of simply a, a few uh, tricks to get the tibia out first. Even in the most uh, difficult, tight patients, taking out the tibia first is, is not difficult uh, after just a few little uh, pearls. In terms of adding the navigation system, I was not doing navigation previously either. Uh, so we looked at that, and in the first seven cases of using navigation, there was about a 25-minute added time cost. After the seven cases, there was zero added time cost. That Those first seven cases were uh, my team and me just getting down our movements more than anything else and just making sure we were proceeding in the right order and taking our time and, and, and getting our, our, uh, pattern, our patterns down. Once you get past that uh, initial step, there's really no added time cost to the navigation system. It, well, it remains well under an hour. When we added the balance spot, which adds uh, additional decision-making, that adds about 90 seconds, and that's the time it takes to do the uh, acquisition and for you to look at the screen and make your decisions about the screen. So it's not a lot of added time. Again, there's a little bit of a learning curve, a short number of cases where you're looking at the screen and you may see a new uh, configuration of the knee, and it might take an extra 30 or 45 seconds to factor that in, but that comes very, very quickly. So the added time cost is uh, very none to very little. Right. So surgeons should plan to add for, account for additional time during the first 10 or so cases, um, and then once they have it in routine. Yeah. Okay. It, I, um, I see another question here from um, Dr. Skade asking, how did we arrive at the pressures used on the balancer? Which is a common yeah. question that we get from, uh, from customers in the field. Yes. And so uh, one benefit of this system is, is that you can vary the pressures over a wide range. Uh, so most commonly we'll use 90 degree, 90 newtons of a pressure applied by the balance spot in extension and 70 newtons applied in flexion. Uh, that's, uh, we've gotten to that point uh, through a process. We started in the lab uh, using 80 newtons throughout the range of motion, and that was based on some uh, preliminary experimental data. That was based on data from the literature. Uh, then we tried a, a lot of cadavers over time. Uh, we took, a, took cadavers to the point of failure, which is well over 300 newtons even in fairly delicate specimens. So the safety factor is built in tremendously, and there are the system won't let you go above 200 newtons. But what it does let you do is you can vary the pressure from uh, full extension down through flexion. It varies on a certain algorithm. But you can set your pressures, and then you can change your pressures based on the particular patient. So as I said, 90 in extension, 70 in flexion is most common. But in a very lax patient, you may go to 80 and 60, uh, or in a very, very tight 
uh, patient, you might use 100 uh, in extension and 80 in flexion. Uh, we're working on ways to uh, characterize that more consistently, uh, even algorithmically, uh, and that's uh, coming up in future iterations. Uh, but as a, as a starting point, 90 and uh, 70 is a great place to start for most patients based on uh, longstanding uh, literature data, our uh, clinical data in the cadaver lab, and then uh, our data in the cadaver lab, and then uh, now uh, well over two years of clinical data. Great. Absolutely. Yeah, keep it simple to start. I agree. Um, and that answers another question from Dr. Mar uh, Martin asking, which forces do we use in uh, flexion and extension? So different forces, often about uh, 20 newtons of difference from extension to flexion. Uh, another question here asking, how can one assess the joint line in the planning screen? Right. Great question. So uh, there's, it's not specifically marked uh, at this point. Uh, what you're looking for, because, right, no one wants to raise the joint line uh, for patellofemoral mechanics and also for uh, the reason of wanting to avoid mid-flexion laxity. So this system currently does not, and I think it will in the future, mark the joint line specifically. But what it lets you do is keep the joint line as absolutely distal as possible by uh, showing you what the result of moving your joint line would be uh, on the ligament balance of the knee. It does not show you what the effect would be on the patellofemoral mechanics. That, that's another uh, uh, set of uh, considerations. But in terms of keeping the joint line most distal, you can see directly what effect you will have on the uh, ligament balance when you start chopping away at more distal femur, which would be raising your joint line. So I try and decide up front on my tibia side uh, if I'm going to take a little extra, if I need a little extra bony cut for my extension space, I might take a millimeter or two extra off the tibia side uh, to begin with. You can always go back and take more tibia too. The system is very easy to go back and do bony recuts when you want to, which is very rare, but if you wanted to, you could. Uh, so it doesn't show you the joint line, but you, you optimize your joint line by paying close attention to your predictive ligament balance curves. I hope that answers your question. Great, yeah, I think it does. So the, the system, to clarify, shows you the amount of resection you're taking off the distal femur um, in relation to the, the thickness of the implant. So if it's a nine millimeter implant and if you're taking more than nine millimeters, you can see the effect of the, uh, the joint line on the medial and lateral side. And as a repercussion, the system will show you the influence on the on the gap predictions throughout the entire range of motion. So you can easily right. so, see. Yeah, and that's so that's, that just segues into a good point, which I wanted to make before, which is the question about mid-flexion laxity and, and trade-offs. Because you're right, you know, we all have in our mind, we don't want to take extra distal femur. You know, some people say, I don't want to take more than two millimeters of distal femur. Some people say five. No one wants to get into the epicondyles. But if you have a patient with a complex deformity, we, what, maybe what one methodology in the past was not try and take too much distal femur, but now what do you do with this really tight extension space? And the answer is you start doing releases all over the place to get the knee corrected. With this system, what you can actually see where the mid-flexion laxity is, uh, and the, you can take the degree of distal femur that you need up to the point that you see mid-flexion laxity beginning to occur. You can move your extension balancing point distally, which is tremendous. It, that is one of the best features of the system, is the ability to change your balance point. And then, as I mentioned before, that does introduce the trade-off of making the knee tighter in full extension. But then you're back to addressing the primary pathology, which is on the, on the back side of the knee, maybe a tight castle. But when you do all those things, you can see the effect. You can see the predictive effect of it. And then also, when you do that release, you can go back and measure the knee and see exactly what you got. Uh, and uh, that is just uh, invaluable in terms of uh, micro adjusting the knee in a, in a bad case. Correct. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I think that uh, relates to the example that you just showed and how you um, change the extension gap planning angle from 10 to, to 15 degrees. 
kind of optimize the, the joint space and extension and, and mid flexion specifically. Uh, another question here, um, do you think that with the tibia first technique, the surgeon has more options to balance uh, the flexion and extension spaces by adjusting the, uh, the cutting levels? Yes, yeah, tibia first definitely gives you more options. Uh, you can set your tibia cut uh, early and then all of your, all the remainder of your options are, first off, they're virtual. You can experiment as much as you like. Uh, and then uh, land on a plan you like. And if you are experimenting and you can't find a plan you like, you can always go back and take more tibia. Uh, so you you really have maximum options doing tibia first. Femur first with a balance spot uh, is is better than femur first without the balance spot for sure. And there's and we'll show you data on that in, in some of the subsequent talks. Uh, but the bottom line is you do far you do your fewest number of releases using the balance spot tibia first, you do your next fewest releases balance spot femur first, and you do your most number of releases without the balance spot femur first. So you definitely have more choices mm -hmm. by putting in the going tibia first with the balance spot. Sure. Have you noticed any difference in your soft tissue release rate since you switched over from a femur first technique to a uh, tibia first technique with the with the balance spot? Uh, definitely. I mean, there are far fewer releases by going tibia first, by doing just a standard exposure in, in, a, in a knee with a mild to moderate deformity, doing a standard exposure, taking out the tibia first, making all the adjustments in the femur, the vast majority of the time we're making no, no additional releases, which is much better mm -hmm. than when I was doing femur first without the balance spot, uh, where we would do the knee and then be playing catch up later in order to get a knee that I said that I thought was good, but these knees have fewer releases and are far better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we'll see some data regarding that in one of the future talks as well. Uh, question here from um, Dr. Koenig actually he says, John, when you said the balance spot adds 90 seconds of time for decision making, maybe it saved you time performing and checking soft tissue releases? Yes, well, that's a great point, Jan, and I hope you're well there. Uh, Yes, there's where you add and subtract time from the case is, is a great point because you are doing less in the way of releases later. The time you spend making decisions and, and looking at the knee prospectively, you you uh, avoid uh, spending later. That's a great point. I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah, thanks. And another question here from Dr. Uh, Rorig. Uh, do you feel that osteophyte removal, both under the collateral ligaments and posteriorly, is necessary before you place the robot and plan the femur? Yes. So that's uh, also a good point. In doing the normal approach, when I say, you know, we do a normal approach to the knee, that does include taking off all available osteophytes. So taking off the ones around both sides of the tibia, all the osteophytes off the uh, femur that are accessible. Now, you can't quite get, I mean, the disadvantage, you could say, of tibia first is that you can't get to those posterior femoral osteophytes uh, fully effectively before you do some of your plans. But it's pretty predictable that uh, in a patient where you look at the radiograph and they have big osteophytes in the back, you know, that's pretty predictable that that's worth uh, several degrees of extension later, which is why in a case like that, I don't worry about it being a little tight in extension when I'm testing my knee uh, at first, because I know I'll get those poster osteophytes and unstick them from the capsule and, and gain uh, three, four, five degrees of extension at the end of the case by doing that. Uh, but all the other osteophytes come out at the beginning before you do your ligament balance assessment, because you want the knee in as close to a final state as possible when you do that. Right. And we also recommend to do that before you do your bone morphing as well to get a uh, accurate reconstruction of the bone model without osteophytes influencing the, the sizing. Good. Right, because if you didn't take those off, you would end up uh, perhaps uh, picking a component that's uh, wider than you needed. Right. Um, another common question that we get from the field is on um, the importance of uh, performing good validations of the bone resections. Um, and I think a lot of people overlook that. Uh, could you maybe comment on why it's important to, to validate the, uh, the resections? 
Yeah. So there, there are, yes, there are, it's, it, it might seem like a little bit of an annoyance at first, but it's not. And it takes, there are only three validations you really have to do. One is your tibial cut. And that's important because you do want to know that you cut to your plan. The system's very accurate within a millimeter and within a degree. And especially on a sclerotic tibia, you may plan for three degrees of posterior slope, but if it's really sclerotic in the back, the, the saw blade uh, can deviate uh, a degree or two. So if you had undercut your posterior tibia, you'd want to know that, and maybe you would want to uh, make sure you recut that or, or at least accounted for it in your mind as you went through uh, the remainder of your planning. Same thing for your femoral cuts. If you have very sclerotic bone, you may find that there's a, a minor deviation. It's important to validate those for two reasons. One, so you can see uh, where the variation occurs. Again, it's minor, but you still want to track it because it can be additive through the case. Uh, and also, you're telling the computer where the actual cut is so it knows uh, how to account for that as well. Again, one, two, three. It's, it's uh, proximal tibia, distal femur, and anterior femur, and it's a very easy to validate. Sure. Yeah, I would add that the uh, the computer computes the uh, the post op gaps based off of the uh, planned or the validated position of the cuts because that's where it calculates the implants to be. So, if you don't validate the cuts accurately, then you could uh, potentially impact your gap measurements. Right, and then you'd be misleading yourself uh, into uh, either being tighter or looser than you actually are. Uh, another question here from um, Leo Beckers. Would you leave the tibia in some degree of varus in a patient with constitutional varus? Common question, yes. Uh, so personally, no. I mean, if they have, uh, say, their other knee is, is fine, but they have, they have some constitutional varus, I wouldn't typically do that just personally, although people do. Uh, it's Again, it's a choice you definitely have. I do bake in some varus and tibia in a patient who has a severe deformity. For example, uh, a guy who has had a 25-degree varus deformity, I use this system uh, to, uh, uh, to his knee. I put in three degrees of varus in the tibia for two reasons. One is to help correct his huge deformity. And the other was to uh, have a better tibial cut because he had a big defect, bone defect on the medial side. I wanted to minimize or at least reduce it to the extent that I could his lateral resection. So I put three, I put the varus that I was going to put into his knee, I put on the tibial side rather than on the femoral side. So you have that option. Uh, just personally, I don't, if they have some constitutional varus, I don't put it on the tibial side. Uh, you definitely can. But the benefit here is you can, because you're seeing the femur, you can adjust the femur to have a balanced knee, even if they had constitutional varus. Or you can put it in if you like, or you, or you can put it in the, on the tibial side if you like. That's the beauty of the system. Yeah. I think we've heard uh, from a few of our surgeon groups now that they'll start to put the tibia in slight varus depending on the morphology of the tibia to avoid maybe overcutting right. on the lateral side if the medial side is uh, very eroded. Or um, like you mentioned, Definitely. if it's a fixed, fixed varus deformity that's you know uncorrectable, they want to minimize the amount of releases. Right. Great question. Um, how about your approach to a valgus knee uh, versus a varus knee? Is there anything different in your approach to to your, a valgus knee? Definitely. Just uh, just as I think uh, many of us would with or without the balance spot, I really uh, cut down my tibial resection because I think we've all had the experience that valgus knees can really, uh, the gaps in a valgus knee can really blow up uh, unpredictably sometimes. So I try and minimize my tibial resection uh, to just a few millimeters off the low side. Uh, and uh, try and, uh, if it's a flexion contracture, I try and uh, minimize uh, my posterior tibial slope in those cases. Uh, but then beyond that, then the basic case is pretty much the same because once you've made your tibial cut and made your decisions there, the rest of the balance of the knee is really done the same way on the thermal planning screen, manipulating the femur to get what you like. So it's really just your decisions you make on the tibial side to avoid the known pitfalls that go along with valgus knees, particularly in lax females. Uh, but then from there on, it's pretty much the same. Great, great. 
Thank you. So if there's any uh, final questions, please uh, feel free to enter them into the, uh, the question box. We've got just a couple minutes left. Um, John, maybe in the meantime, I can ask you a, a final question. One, one of the ones we always get from, um, from new surgeons is regarding the, uh, the limits of uh, femoral axial rotation. How far can they internally or externally rotate the femur to, to accommodate balance? Right. That, that's a tremendous question. And I think, uh, certainly you'll hear, you'll see the data on that from, uh, Jeff or Jeff. Uh, what's tremendous about this system, and this is one of these areas I was talking about that we're able to probe now with data and with results is how far to rotate the femur. And I've had cases now where I've rotated the femur a well below uh, zero into internal rotation range with the confidence that the knee is balanced and then looking at the patellofemoral joint to make sure that the patellofemoral tracking is intact. But patellofemoral tracking is not solely a function of femoral rotation. Yeah. I think patellofemoral tracking and patellofemoral problems are a function of rotation plus the remainder of the balance of the knee. So if you can have a knee that's well balanced in flexion and extension in between the medial and lateral compartments, and you have good uh, patellofemoral tracking, that's a happy patient. So the system will turn yellow. I mean, the numbers, as I showed you, when we went to seven degrees of external rotation, the numbers went from uh, black to yellow. Just to tell you that you're beyond seven degrees, it'll show you the same thing once you get internally rotated. But we have good data showing that uh, even fair amounts of internal rotation on the femoral component, if it achieves balance, particularly in flexion, if it helps you achieve balance in flexion, then overall the patient reported outcome is better than if you don't have that balance. So the, the answer to your question, Chris, and the answer that we, to the question we commonly get is, yes, you can rotate the femur quite a bit. I, personally, I've taken it uh, fairly far, uh, seven, eight, nine degrees of internal rotation in uh, cases where I had to and really lax patients. And those patients have done very well, and they've had good patellofemoral tracking without the need for releases, even a lateral release. Uh, the key is if the knee is balanced and you've treated the midflexion laxity or the potential midflexion laxity, and you've treated the other problems with the knee, the patella will track well uh, and it will perform well. Great, great. Thanks, John. Uh, another question here from um, uh, from Dr. Jan Koenig. Have you ever had a case that you could not use the system on? Well, no. I mean, no, not really, because I've had, uh, I mean, a patient who, who I just know will not do well with a, I mean, I use the ultra congruent, uh, uh, CR ultra congruent. There is Standard CR, there's CR ultra congruent, and then there is the PS, and then there are the revision options. So uh, right now this system is not, the, the Omnibotics is not uh, uh, certified for revision use. Uh, it can't be marketed for revision use. So if I have a patient who I know is running through the territory of needing a very constrained knee or a hinged knee, then uh, I wouldn't. Uh, go there necessarily yet, at least officially. So I've, through patient selection, uh, I've always been able to uh, get the job done. I guess the collateral question is, what do you do if uh, certain aspects of the system, you know, if, if the power goes out and, and uh, the processor dies on the computer, what do you do? Well, there are several backups to that. Um, and that's a concern for all of us as surgeons. We don't want to be left hanging mid case. So, you can still obtain your data. Depends what what wasn't working, and the system's very reliable, I, so it's not really a concern. Except it's good to have backups. But if you're using the balance bot, you have uh, other ways of measuring the balance of the knee. You have other ways of cutting the knee, and we always have a manual system as backup. Uh, but no, I've never really not been able to complete a case. Uh, even that fellow with a 25 degree varus deformity, and a, I think he had a 15 degree flesh contracture. As long as he had, you know, intact soft tissues, you can complete the procedure with a balance block. Great, great. 
Okay, one last final question here from uh, Dr. Roy. Can you comment on whether the Omnibot demonstrates differences between the polyethylene insert trial designs, i.e. The, the standard versus the ultra-congruent? Well, so when you do your initial ligament assessment, the balance bot is a, a round on flat configuration. So the balance bot mm -hmm. paddles are flat and you have your femur uh, in its native state. When you uh, then test it uh, with your femoral trial in place, you, you attach the balance bot uh, little uh, cuffs that uh, mimic your insert. So the only difference would be anterior posterior stability, which I measure and, and, and feel and the system can show you how much translation there is, although I haven't really tracked that as one of my decision-making points, uh, except a real outlier, I, mean, I would pay attention to that. But it's not a, a typical parameter of determining in the decision-making process formally. It, it, part of the anteroposterior activity, of course, is part of the uh, assessment of the knee, but I've never run into a problem where there's been anterior-posterior laxity in an otherwise well-balanced knee. Correct. Great. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Keggy. That uh, concludes our um, session today. I just wanted to once again um, thank you for your time and uh, your insights are always extremely valuable. You've been uh, um, a user and a uh, supporter of uh, this technology since its uh, early inception. And I think uh, the knowledge and the clinical experience you bring to uh, the group and uh, the audience is uh, just phenomenal for us. So, Thanks again for your time. Thank you. It's a great team, and it's a great uh, it's, it's a great technology. Uh, it's really revolutionized the way I think about knees and uh, uh, the way uh, the way they're executed.